Hi there, today I'm going to be talking about Cyborg. This is an initial quick uh, overview. I've only had it a day, so I've kind of skim read through it to get the uh, gist of it, and I'll give those initial impressions in this video. Smart move. So yeah, uh, sorry, distracted by Barbarian, but there was a reason I wanted to show it um, in addition to talking about the book. So I'll just switch the, uh, the beast off. Oh, I'm gonna die now on the next level. So I'm definitely gonna make some mistakes. It's gonna be hard to get everything down here correctly, but I will, I will do my best. Um, because I've only just skimmed reading. <laughs> so, you know, please, you know, experts in this would be uh, welcome to um, tell me the specific way that I should be uh, playing the game, but I'll be trying it my best as an initial review. Book-wise, it's solid. It's a hardback. It's published by Free League Publishing. It's Stockholm Cartel. It's a mortboard hacked... Um, so it's essentially using the sort of core old school Renaissance OSR style retro rules that you see in in uh, Morkborg and just twisting it up into a cyberpunk setting. And production wise, you've got quite a nice um, print quality, uh, definitely good print quality. Two of these nice ribbons in there to, to set your position. And it follows that theme of having the um, kind of chaotic, punky style uh, layout, which kind of goes against all of the traditional um, desktop publishing layout. Um, what would you call them? Methods, rules. Um, so it's good <laughs> for that in the sense that, you know, all the fonts are different all over the place. The layout uses different styles. It'll flip from like black on white text to white on pink text or something and, and will sometimes be a little bit difficult to read, which is just interesting as in itself because you, you're kind of challenged by that as you work through. And it's fun, so it's great. You know, it's a particular aesthetic um, which I enjoy, and um, the art's kind of big in there too, and the layouts is, is really nice. Um, so, good looking book, solid feel to it. They go right up to the edges with some reference guides in here as well, which was fantastic to see. And um, I shall now sort of talk through it, really. Um, we've got um, a section to start with that introduces that it's cyberpunk. Um, well, they don't say, I don't know if they actually use the term cyberpunk anywhere. They definitely use punk and cyber in different uh, levels. I wonder if there's some kind of like copy, copy protection on, on, on the use of the word, of the phrase cyberpunk, the whole William Gibson thing. But anyway, the, um, the setting is sort of post-apocalyptic plus um, that kind of big corporations ruling a kind of messed up city. Everybody's wired into the web or the net and um, they're all corrupted, infected, and messed up in some way or another with this sort of um, palatial high-rise glass areas of the city managed by corporations and um, the super rich having private armies as well as the corporations having private armies as well. So that's, that's, that's good, I like that. Um, and they give it a light touch you know they're not their background in here isn't going to give you the names of uh, you know all the different corporate heads and their families and where they hang out and all of that kind of good stuff that um some people enjoy reading i'm i'm not a fan of this is much lighter it's like a like a hook into a flavor of how those things operate for the different regions we've got the business enterprise ports with all of the usual stuff that goes on there in terms of trade and corruption and entertainment um, industries. It's talking about the sickening smog around these shrouded industrial areas, slums, you can imagine the sort of real low grade living on the water, tells you a little bit about that. The hills, obviously where the execs are. <clears throat> so your, your, um, you know, you kind of Tory and Republican types living in their sheltered um, 
accommodation and not wanting any change to maintain their positions of power. Uh, so that's the hills. Uh, the in-betweens, which is sort of uh, your um, corporate types, your wage slaves, your um, cub cubicle zombies, um, the beyond, which is outside of Nega City, um, and you can imagine the wasteland there too. Um, and then you've got a bit on the net as well. Um, so yeah, they give you that flavour, bolts together, the city and everything. There's one area that I think I would not covered. There's like some kind of like corrupted place. I can't remember where that one was. Oh, here it is. Yeah, G0. This is where the rock fell, the bombs dropped, a post-apocalyptic quagmire kept in quarantines so with massive walls around it. So again, you've got that flavour where you can um, say, you know, there might be some reason why you have to go out into this G0, you know, ground zero region. Um, and it's got big doors onto there and hints on that. So that's nice. That's all. That's just the right kind of level of background I like, really. <laughs> and then it dives into how you have, um, how you've got a, a sort of mechanic called Miserable Headlines. Fantastic font there as well. It took me quite a while to see what it was saying. My brain had to actually work. And um, inside the here is a D66 roll that the Games Master makes uh, every night at like midnight on the um, uh, during the game, which can have a, an effect of where an event will happen, like anti-human bioterror attack. The body count uh, climbs of biobombings of several passenger cars earlier tonight. Metro monorail and tram carts are closed, while major uh, sec corps compete to hunt down the 66666 world terrorist cell that claims credit for the act. So you've got... Um, actual events in there plus it could be that you roll d66 and you just get something like there's a really heavy filthy poisonous smog out there so yeah a whole blend of um lighter and more serious events that keep going and you keep rolling every every night so that the player characters could be you know in the middle of a heist or doing something that very particular to, for their uh, gang or their group um, but these are a nice backdrop to that and allow you to sort of mess up things going on uh, at the same time, add a bit of chaos into what's happening. So that's good. Um, yes, and that's the first section. Then we're over on to um, the system. Um, and let's do that. So system. A system, 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 a system. It's basically a section where it allows you to make your characters and tells you a little bit about the combat. And the um, the routine for doing that, if I zoom down to the phone, which should just work there, is roll your abilities, randomize your stuff, roll your debt, roll your glitches, roll your hit points, get stuff done. I'm not going to say that because I don't know whether YouTube watches those sort of things or not. But um, D8, D12 and d12 are the three different rolls you make for your gear rolling once on each table you might get stolen taxi um, you might get a crowbar uh, you might get a tiny drone a surveillance drone or something in there as well so it's quite a nice little table to allow um, some flavor from the items you're carrying and this is the entirety of the rules so you've got all of that all of this it's on these two pages <laughs> oh my face isn't up um, so it's really comprehensive uh, that, <laughs> that you've got mostly everything you need here. Your abilities, which are your stats, there's five of them. Agility, knowledge, presence, strength, and toughness. I noticed straight away a good thing here, which I, I liked, which is that presence has the snipe and shoot, um, but agility is auto fire. So they've already kind of broken down two stats covering uh, similar activities, so shoot, shooting weapons, although you've got other things within those that you get bonuses on. Um, but it does mean that if your presence was, say, 15 and you got a plus two for that calm single shot, it's not necessarily going to mean that your agility is also high, depending on your character build, of course. But um, if you wanted the total warrior, you know, ranged attack warrior, agility and presence would give you that auto fire and and sniping shooting. But in terms of rules, um, it doesn't mean you can't do either of those. It's just a small bonus you get based on your stat, which can be up to um, up to 20, depending on modifiers. But it's the classic 3d6 roll, 
to generate each ability. And then it has a little hint that the, if you're classless, so you haven't picked a class, uh, you can roll 4d6 and drop the lowest for two abilities of your choice. So that would just give you the edge on a couple of abilities because the classes, which we'll move on to shortly, do give you bonuses on these abilities here. And the entire rule system it doesn't have separate skills or anything. It is just simply using the score that you get from your ability. So if you had 15 in agility, you get plus two on your agility rolls. And agility will cover things like sneaking around, dodging, driving, auto fire. And the way that mechanism works on the D20 is that you have a difficulty rating. And I've noticed actually difficulty normal 12 is is used nearly for almost everything in here. It's um, pretty much uh, a normal standard um, for attacks and things, but then all the modifiers apply on top of that, depending on the uh, situation. So 12 on a D20 is a typical target for normal activities. And depending on what you're doing, let's just say you were using tech to crack something, a security gate, you'd use your knowledge and whatever the stat is, you'd get a bonus on, on that. And that's it, pretty pretty simple, D20 for everything. Um, but obviously you've got the damage dice and things, you've got D6s, and D8s and more, depending on what weapon you're using as well. So it's a very quick thing. I'm gonna to dive to the back of the book. I'm gonna switch back to my face as well here, because it might be a bit easier. Go down to the desk. Oh, got my phone, go down to the desk and face there. Yes, picture in picture. So in the back, they have the references which could kindly cover things like combat and, and bits and pieces like that. But basically, as I mentioned before, it's this difficulty rating 12 is across quite a lot of things. So if you are taking a single shot, you'd be te testing your presence. So you'd add a bonus uh, score, depending on what the score uh, was. It could be a minus. If you've got only eight in your presence, you'd be minusing one off the roll. And on the D20, you've got a, with that bonus or modifier, um, You've got to get that target of 12 to get a hit. It doesn't mean the creatures don't have armor classes um, or the monsters or the other um, cyber junkies that you're bumping into. They You just hit on this. Now, I've noticed that a couple of creatures and things, they might say something like, this is small. So the difficulty goes up to 14 instead of 12 to hit it because it's like a small skull-like head that's scuttling around um, and shooting you with it, laser eye beams. Um, it would be 14 target hit because it's a little bit harder and it'll say that on the creature but it won't list like a bunch of acs or armor classes or what have you for each one it's just like a nice simple uh target again that would sp speeds up game master's role doesn't it in the game because they can just very quickly throw out uh something into the game and then know that um you got to hit it but um this is the interesting one and i think i've got this right but people could correct me on this defense which is based on you completing a dodge um, under agility. And this interested me straight away as well. <laughs> I mentioned earlier the rules are like chaotically laid out and things, but it's easy to find things just skimming through really, and you can be very quick to learn. There's not a lot in there. Like those two pages really define the core of the rules. But this just um, bugged me a little bit because you test agility to do a defense when you're trying to dodge some incoming fire and they call it defense, but actually the agility ability, um, it calls it dodge there rather than defense. So I might have just called it dodge there as well, just to keep it all, you know, use the same terminology throughout dodge, dodge, um, but they call it defense in this combat table here. It may be that I've just, it's just this table and further in the combat section, it might actually, um, just say it is dodge but there you go and then the player character rolls a d20 themselves again difficult rating 12 which could be modified because it might be that um, they've got some other cybernetic muscle ability that makes them slightly better at defense or, or it could be that the attack is particularly harsh um, but essentially again roll over that 12 use your agility bonus so if your agility was 20 you'd get plus three on that and um, you would avoid the incoming damage. But if you don't avoid the incoming damage, it's the traditional method of the games master would then say, right, well, you know, it's that cyber claws hitting you for a D6 damage. They'd roll the damage and you would then minus a certain amount of armor off that, which just depends on the roll that you make. So again, if you're in armor, um, T6 
tier three, it's going to take minus a d6 um, damage off whatever damage is coming in. So the, the armor is like a variable soak, it's probably worth calling it that, against incoming damage. And that softens the blow, I guess, of this being a kind of um, a retro OSR game in the sense that there is this sort of buffer zone of armor that you can pick up that gives you a little bit of potential to soak. Um, and then in terms of injury and death, um, basically you're battered at zero hit points um, and then you take a d8, um, roll it here and you might get hemorrhage death in, two, in, two, in d2 hours, all tests are, and it gives you a difficulty rating hike of plus four or you roll an eight when you're on zero hit points <clears throat> and you're dead. In the dead bracket down here, it does tell you that there's a chance if you had a certain amount of money in the bank that you've got a 50% chance of being saved by an emergency response team. And then it tells you how long you're going to be sat in, in um, intensive care to survive it. So, I mean, that's the core of the rules and bits and pieces. Um, but let's go back to the character types, the classes. So but you can have this nanomancer and they are shunned and they are generally just a sort of really weirdly corrupted so you sort of roll on here to get some sort of corruption through there they're also weird so they actually get 3d6 and plus two on their roll for um presence when they're creating their presence stat and they're also ill so they get a reduction on their um toughness but flavor wise they've obviously got some interesting spooky stuff going on you get some special things like a second mouth where your navel used to be an el elongated pointed semi-translucent scun scun skull scales over most of your body so you're resistant to heat and radiation and things so yeah they're the corrupted infected weird things um burned hacker so you're sort of a burnt out hacker and they get some changes to some stats and some abilities and things as well you can build your own app, uh, a terror app, targets RCD renders subliminal personalized nightmare imagery that distorts reality, test presence or unable to, unable to act. So you can sort of take over someone's mind, um, terrorize them with your gear. So that's that one. Corp killer, discharge corp killer. So obviously army, army style um, gearhead. They've got a little robot that goes along with them. And this guy, which is obviously the sort of brutal martial arts killer. Um, Death Incarnate, Frenzied Flurry of Chrome, Murder and Bloodstained Steel. And of course, Saken Gangoon. Gangoon. And then you've got some extra optional sort of tables to flavor NPCs or characters with styles and features like lipless, just teeth. Um, and you've got quirks, um, wants, current obsession model mech kits that's me um and then your weapons and these are very um simple really there's not like a they're, they're a classic old school style in there you've got like a shotgun a d8 damage and um you've got a whole load of other bits and pieces pulse rifle d10 if there's an a after the um the weapons damage type it can do automatic which means it could hit up to three times but you have to succeed the first then the second then the third hit in a row um, to, to get the next attack and then armor those tiers i mentioned earlier you go right up to tier six end game exosuit equipped with multiple customizable injectors jump jets motorized joints not for sale so you know running from no armor to less like a style guard rough smart wear so I guess this is where it's starting to get a little bit more interesting. And it tells you things that they can do. They have these HST auto injectors, so you get bonuses from those as well once they're injecting you. Then you have a debt, so and it tells you who to. Um, so that's quite fun. That again hooks you straight in that there might be someone that's after you or you owe someone something. And then you've got various other bits of equipment and their costs, everything from motorbikes to drone suits to noisemakers. And it's got service costs as well. Ad blocking. <laughs> um, and more weapons for sale. These are bigger than the stuff on the other page, like rocket launchers, flashbang, hand grenades. Single-use booster mods. So they're like a kind of an instant drug thing. Test presence or temporarily trigger a random nano infestation. Sounds fun. It's got some drugs on there and what they do. Costs as well. 
Cybertech and what the Cybertech gives you as bonuses. Apps, which is all about how you can hack things and take over and do attacks, take over systems, get people's cameras in control, open doors, everything along those lines. And um, here are some backlashes if things go wrong when you're trying to uh, hack things in the net. Black Ice, I remember that from, um, was it Blue Ice? From one of the uh, William Gibson books. So, um, and then you've got some nano powers. So they're interesting. Infestations, which obviously are probably not good things. Radiance, a faint eerie glow surrounds you. Geiger counters malfunction in your presence. Elongated fingers, twice the length they may be useful. Painfully twist and bend. You're unable to use weapons or other items requiring a firm grip for a certain amount of time. So yeah, they sound nasty, the infestations. Um, and then you've got glitches. Um, so you begin with D2 glitches and they allow you to do things like deal maximum damage with one attack, re-roll a dice roll, yours or someone else's, lower damage dealt to you by D6. So these are like, again, nice little edges or check details that let you sort of become a little bit more survivable or push an attack. Um, and you need a chance to rest before you can use a glitch again. But they're just nice little things. Still max damage while attacks. Just a nice little uh, thing to be able to do between rests. Neutralize a crit or a fumble as well. So, yeah, nice. You, I think you just pick which one of those you want. And you can have either one or two, depending on that D2 roll. Uh, and then hit points. Um, and again, it's detailing what I would mentioned before on the back here in terms of like when you get to zero, you fall unconscious. Um, and um, on that roll of a d8, when you're at zero, you could end up with being dead from from ranging from just falling unconscious for a while or being completely dead. <laughs> uh, or a critical injury, the body table to see where you hit. So this is the body table here. Um, and it has to be replaced or regrown. Do you have your head in there? No, I just don't think you can replace or regrow the head. Yeah, it's more detailed than that. It's not just going to be a headshot that takes you out. Initiative. So basically on initiative, you roll a d6 and one to three enemies go first, four to six the PCs, and the PCs will pick their own order. Um, um, or you could just go you go, go around the table one at a time is another easy way of doing that. But allowing them to pick their order on their go means that they could coordinate well if they're, you know, they're up to that. Some players like to be asked, you know, one at a time. Others are, are quite happy to coordinate the group. Um, me melee attacks, you roll, uh, it's again, difficult rate, rating 12 on a d20. So clean roll of d20 on a 12 plus uh, you've hit and you roll for damage. Same applies for ranged attacks, single shots, um, use your presence, difficulty rating 12. And auto fire is also difficulty rating 12, but uses your agility instead. And... Um, if you hit once the first time with the agility, you can then try uh, with the auto fire. You can then try a second attack. If you hit again, you can try a third attack, and then that's three attacks is the maximum you can do. Um, you've got some fumbles and crits as well, and fumbles are things like out of ammo or the weapon misfiring. And then it's got some optional combat mods for cover, aiming, range. Just make things a little bit easier for people or harder depending if there's cover. You've got light and hard cover. And then you've got suppressive fire. Spender mag is an automatic weapon to suppress up to D3 targets. And they make and it's then harder for them to, you know, deep they're adding plus four to any of their target uh, uh, ratings to hit because they have uh, uh, bullets firing all around them and it's gonna they'll be hunkering down. That's combat, very, very light, but feels crunchy, effective, and interesting. You've got morale. Uh, I won't go into that because I haven't read enough into that yet. Um, you've got some improvements. You can, you can't, there's no levels. There's not like level one, two, three or anything, but the, the, the games master can say we're at a point where you can try and um, raise an ability um, or there might be something in the lining of your jacket uh, that gives you a nano power or something. You might get more hit points. You roll 60, 10 if the result is equal to greater than your current hit points, increase it by D6. So very much up to the games master to decide, actually, we're at a point, maybe we're at the end of a couple of sessions uh, where you can level up or you finished a heist or something. Um, 
and then we're into the beasts, the monsters. It's uh, you know, like, what is this? It's a Roadrunner, Wasteland Scavenger. Uh, they have five hit points, morale five. Waster's Tux, which is obviously some kind of um, ability that means it's a minus D2 on their uh, armor if they get hit. And they've got Assault Rifle, which is a D8, and it can fire automatically. There's various different kinds in here, nano-powered ones, drones, um, little skulls that fire lasers out of their eyes. But again, I mentioned, I think, earlier that they are DR-14 rather than DR-12, which is the standard. They're a little bit harder uh, to hit. Bloated walking corpses, combat vehicles are in here, mechs. So, yeah, straight up with this kind of mech, it's 50 hit points. Nigh indestructible, minus D10. So everything that tries to hit it is going to have minus D10. You need a rocket launcher uh, on that. And it actually has more rocket launchers and lasers. Very difficult to tackle with. So you have Ghost. And then you have Data section, which is lots more tables and things for helping you um, pull do quirks and obsessions, features, styles. You've got a mission generator, so I help you put up together who the contact is. Is there a patron? What's involved? Um, what's the reward? So you can quickly fire and help you pull together a quick mission if you want to do something. Uh, you've got locations where they are. Uh, location features. Paper thin internal walls. It's quite an interesting one. Bullets are going to go through there. A corporation, a corp generator. And just some other bits and pieces so I won't go into the detail um, there is a, an adventure an introductory heist and it tells you the characters and some maps and details of that in there as well and in the Kickstarter uh, at least you can probably still buy these as well but there's a flip pad this is actually every game system should come with one of these a nice sort of flip pad of character uh, sheets you can just give those out and you're away and I have over here the um, all-important item, which is a location pad. Um, so it also has the names of who's contributed to some of these in here. But then you get multiples of them as well. So you've got a train, subway train, and there's a few. So it's not a miniatures game, but you could just put little tokens and things on there. You could scribble on there, or you're here, the, the assailants are coming through the door there. And you get multiple copies, and they have those nice little extra details in, in here as well, and the, the sense that you've got, it's a derelict oil rig, but it's telling you some things about the locations too. Um, yeah, and little hooks, and um, hardened hacker nest, pirate city worth of power from undersea cables to run several data centers with offensive devices, autonomous AI, black ice agents, roam cyberspace, mountain security drones in meat space, each hacked from one of the many assaults on the compound. Um, so yeah, you can quickly go, we're going to an oil rig. <laughs> Here it is a quick map. Let me roll up what's happening or just fit it into your own game as well. Data crypt. So that was nice location pad. Well worth um, getting that if you're going to be running some of these and just want to quickly sort of tear one out and then um, get a little game on with a location. I think interestingly enough, games with guns are, um, I mean, all games like D&D &D and everything need, need a degree of like explanation of where the, where the characters are in a map, but games with this sort of specific thing where there's a lot of security cameras, there's a lot of like cyber things going on. A location does become quite interesting then because, you know, where's the data hub? Where's the video center? Where's the, where are the people in this back room that I've got to get to? It just definitely makes for an interesting, um, supportive bit of product with the rules to have this to hand. So there we go. Well, th thanks. I'm really pleased with this Kickstarter. Uh, I'd like to get a game in with some friends if I can if I can convince them to try sort of retro again. Um, you know, I think like many people now, you face um, quite a challenge when you've got new players to sort of get them off D and D and into something a bit different, but. Um, Sometimes it's possible if you can sort of fire their imagination and sell a system and have a couple of nice games. 
um, going ongoing. Um, it feels like it'd be really quick to set up. Characters would be made in like 20 minutes and you could just get onto a game for some one shots or continue a little campaign with um, a series of heists or uh, events happening in there. It's quite a nice toolkit. It looks good. I would add it to my collection, which I did. So I recommend you do as well. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening in. Bye.